Welcome to broadcasting to the entirety of the Super Smash Brothers community. This is Beyond the Metagame. I'm your host, P.N. This week, I'm live from Nicaragua, and I'm drinking a delicious little margarita. I'm joined, as always, by my wonderful co-host, A.V. A.V., how you doing, big boy? And I'm doing pretty great. Got a, got a drink of my own. And uh, I'm looking over the the deep blue horizon uh, that is in front of us, this, this, beautiful, this beautiful seascape. And well, what, what does it make you think about? I'm feeling a little sentimental. What, what, is, what does this, uh, this ocean make you think about? What does it make me think about? Yeah. I've always wanted there to be like a blue Shrek named Derek. <laughs> Why? Like what what prompted Derek to to come in, to come into your mind? So guys, we had a lot of new countries tune in over last week. Uh and this might be one of our best weeks yet, A V. We have Ireland, the Virgin Islands, hey lads. Uh, Lebanon, Denmark, Bahrain, and Singapore. Um, yes, there's a lot of good ones, man. I, I, it's hard to believe. I, I, I know that you, you're of the mind that there's actually somebody with a VPN just trolling us, like beaming in from Bahrain. And Dude, maybe uh, it's Derek. <laughs> I think it is. I think it is, man. I think it is. Okay, but uh, yeah, hey, as always, thank you guys so much for tuning in uh, from wherever you're tuning in. Um, we appreciate you, and we're happy to to be broadcasting. I don't know, man. There's something so romantic about the idea of just like talking into the mic, and then and then and then anyone with a with a pair of headphones and an internet connection can listen. I don't know. Am I am I just a romantic? Does that is that actually not that cool? I mean, I, I think it's super cool. I think it's really awesome that we've uh, we've kind of reached a lot of people, and I hope it grows because we have because uh, we we're really interested in uh, growing people's interest in joining the competitive scene and just enjoying Smash. So uh, from and the thing is, Smash is such a universal thing that everyone loves. So kind of uniting people among one like one very easily unifying aspect is is a very beautiful thing yeah thank you for putting it so well that's what it is it's it's all these people from all around the world and we all like to punch princess peach with bowser i don't know it's it's stupid it's simple that it it doesn't matter but it brings us all together in a world that that is otherwise otherwise uh splintered and fractured at times so hey cheers guys uh but uh, to transition away from that, um, I I want to give you a challenge. And Av, this is not something that I've talked with you off the air. I kind of just typed into the show notes without really addressing it. Um, but look, guys, we're we're really close to 2019, and a lot of this show, what the core tenets of it is, um, is using Smash as this platform for like self improvement. And uh, today. As you can tell by the, the, the title, uh, we're talking about comfort zones and the whole idea of getting beyond immediate discomfort in pursuit of long-term benefit and reward. And I feel so hypocritical uh, professing that message where in my own life I so frequently fall short of that standard that I wish to advocate for. Um, and namely, uh, I want to talk about uh, fitness, you know, I, like I, I'm a recent college graduate and my interests are such, um, to where I spend a lot of time in front of a computer in front of, uh, my switch these days, um, you know, at the office and I haven't been moving as much as, you know, my, the, the university student version of myself did. And man, I'll just be honest. I've gained some weight. Uh, which is, I don't know. It seems it seems contradictory to to the message that we preach. And I want to say, guys, I want I want to invite you guys to join me in the pursuit of forming some good habits and uh, get more physically fit. Uh, so right now, I'm at 250 pounds. Uh, and I want to document maybe in a month or so. I'll do another update, but I want to kind of make it public, you know, uh, just so that I. I feel incentivized to keep going. And I also want to 
encourage you guys to make some positive changes too. And, you know, maybe I'll make a little tab in our discord server to, to, to track our progress and to, to kind of uh, grow together in that way. AV, what do you think about all this? Yeah, I think it's cool. Um, as someone that's very dedicated to, to exercise in the gym, uh, <laughs> I am, I'm not, I'm not against a, uh, little challenge to, to help to help everyone kind of come together and uh and and be, like create get out of our comfort zones and create more healthy lifestyles for ourselves so i'm gonna say right now whoever has the most shocking progress whoever does the most with this challenge of mine whoever um makes the biggest transformation let's say uh by the end of february um will get a prize from me, un- un- unannounced at this point, and will be featured on our website's Hall of Fame. What about that, A.V.? Does that sound like a cool plan? That sounds like a great plan to me, P.M. But this week, back to Smash, uh, we're talking about comfort zones. Uh, I guess it's not uh, too 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 big of a gap, like I said, but um, we're talking about the familiar and how the familiar can sometimes be a detriment. Uh, to us and and how how we can go about breaking away from our comforts in pursuit of progress av any last thoughts before we go into it yeah i think uh some of the most important things to take away from this episode are like what what uh just basically understand what are the comfort zones that that me or peon have have gotten ourselves into Relate these to your own situations. Under, like, ask yourself, how can I use the techniques that we describe to get out of our our comfort zones? Do we need to get out of it? Are we are we happy with where we are? Do we view where what are our goals as Smash players? Do we have an interest in learning new tech or expanding on what we already know? Do we want to learn new characters? Do we not? Do we do we want to learn new things? Uh, as usual, I'll recommend do a lot of introspection as you listen along to the episode proper, and truly try to find yourself in 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 parts of our messages. So, guys, all that and more in just one second. Welcome back to Beyond the Meta Game. This week, AV and I are here to talk to you about comfort zones. AV, I've been playing this game uh, quite a bit. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you'd hope. I, I do run a Smash Brothers podcast. Um, right. And, I mean, it's incredible. But I don't know about you, but I'm starting to feel some resistance. Uh, you know what I mean? I, I'm starting to feel that when I play... I'm having to manually break a lot of habits, you know, step away from the safety blanket, you know, take off the, the comforter. What's it called? What what, what are those? uh, The training wheels? (laughs) Training wheels is good. Oh, I was trying to think of the word snuggie. Take the snuggie Uh, off. We're out in the wilderness. Uh, What about you, man? How, How are you feeling? Yeah, I'm feeling fairly similar. I think there's a lot of, new stuff that's not necessarily too difficult to implement if you really think about it but there's enough stuff that i that i feel like i can get away with by just like playing smash (laughs) four-ish and and still and and still do and basically still do well so yeah there is this like strange tug of war in my mind between do i want to go with the success i'm having playing as if it was the previous game or do I want to really completely change my mind and take an initial hit in 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 the ego? Like, so basically, I'm going to be doing worse in friendlies against people. Uh, I'm going to be uh, struggling at the beginning, but in the in the long run, it's probably going to to be a good thing. So yeah, I am struggling to 
to really take to to really just dive in and and take that leap. Yeah, I want to talk about that because you, for those who don't know, AV uh, in Smash Four, he played a Donkey Kong that was super patient, fundamentals based, and revolved very heavily around the kill confirm, being the cargo up throw to up air, aka the ding dong. And right now, I mean, I've been playing against you a little bit on Wi Fi here or there, and you know, Wi Fi is Wi Fi, you know, take it take it for what it is. But um, your game style really reflects that of your Smash Four game style, you know, almost pound for pound. I mean, now you're using the Donkey Kong kill kill option off the grab, where you do the runoff <laughs> cargo down throw, which is just so infuriating uh, for those who haven't played against a good Donkey Kong. Basically, you get grabbed at 70, and Donkey Kong just jumps off the stage and down throws you, and it's it's broken. <laughs> but um, but I, I I complain, but you know, what do you think about that, man? You're you're using the same exact kind of cheese. That got you a lot of success in Smash Four. You know, do you think that that is hindering your growth? Do you think there are pros and cons to that? Like, I don't know. Like, how do you justify not changing it up? Absolutely, I think it is hindering my growth in a way, in the sense that, like, before I found out about this this uh, weird kill confirm, I I was do I was a lot I was being a lot more creative. I was forced to expand on a on a character without ha- having to rely on any like specific kill confirm and what i found was that after i discovered it i actually felt a lot more displeased with the character uh which is an interesting thought in terms of, like i was i was telling someone about it and they were and they were very intrigued to hear me say that i like donkey kong less after <laughs> discovering this really this this really uh, I guess cool is one way to put it, but <laughs> this really strong uh, mechanic, and I relate this back to I think when I played Sheik in Smash Four. I think Sheik was my very first main, and I played her before the massive nerfs, uh, before they kind of took away her really oppressive fare, and I found myself doing much better after the nerfs because it forced me to think and to adapt my gameplay. I foresee a very similar thing happening again because because I think that this uh, this crutch of this cargo down throw off stage might get patched out, and I really don't want to rely on it. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I I feel that I'm kind of going through a similar thing where I I've been trying to play Inkling as my primary character. Um, yeah, as I've said in 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 episodes prior, um, I love the way Inkling plays. Uh, she's very strong. Uh, she really compliments my play style. And, you know, I'm growing and growing, getting better and better. But Inkling is a really unique character. Um, she, you know, th- her play style has never really been captured in any other um, character prior in the series. So it's a completely, a completely new style that I'm having to, to acquire, right? And, you know, sometimes when I don't know how to deal with a certain matchup, like let's say Villager... Inkling versus Villager has been really tough for me. Uh, and it's really been tempting for, to me uh, to pick up Cloud again, you know, my Smash 4 main. And because I already know how that matchup works. I know how the strengths of Cloud uh, can work against the, the weaknesses of Villager. And, and when I do play that matchup, Cloud Villager, I kind of body Villager. You know, I, I kind of step into my comfort zone. And the thing is, is I want, part of me really wants to challenge myself and say, look, no, I don't want to have to rely on this counter pick. I just want to have a good inkling. I want to be a really well-rounded inkling player. Um, and then part of me is like, well, if you already have a solution, you know, why are you trying to find another one? I mean, you'll, you only need one solution. You don't need two. <laughs> yeah. And so I'm having this internal struggle right now where it's like, okay, do I want to have multiple characters? Uh, do I want to just stick it out? Um, and I, I don't have the answer for myself yet. I mean, I'm, hope, I'm hoping this episode I'll, I'll kind of develop my thoughts about that and we can talk through it. But, yeah, man, I mean, what do you think about that? What do you think about, you know, having multiple characters, one which represents your comfort zone and the other one is a new frontier, right? How do you, how do you make sure to not fall into the, in the trap of only playing what's comfortable? Um, so I was actually talking about this 
earlier today with some of the people from our Discord, and I was explaining that whenever I go into a new Smash game, or really, I mean, <laughs> it's like when I went, it's whenever I, uh, I go into any game or any fighting game, I will look at the the best characters in the game, and I will play all of them. I actually think this is one of the best ways to make sure that uh, that you can perform with with different characters and make sure that that your that your gameplay is fresh and that you're not stagnating or getting into a certain comfort zone. Also, it helps me learn the matchups. So my innate way of kind of avoiding this is by doing that. I like playing a lot of characters, and I've been doing that in this game. I actually feel fairly comfortable with most of the really good characters in this game. And that might be because a lot of the really good characters in this game are sword characters, which are all really <laughs> intuitive to play. Yeah, four of them are the exact same. Like, all the Fire Emblem characters minus Ike and Robin and Korin are all, are all like... If you can play one, I feel like you can play all of them to some extent. Right, yeah. And I've been also playing a bit of Pichu and Pikachu... I've been playing a bit of Inkling, and uh, some uh, although K Rule isn't really top tier, top tier on Wi Fi probably. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I have been playing a ton of characters, and I guess to avoid that, I, I think I, to avoid like getting stuck with just playing DK, I have been changing it up a little. But I find that to give myself some credit, there are many things different about my Ultimate DK than my uh than my smash 4 dk uh even i think the wonderful part about uh, about the 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 kill confirm and it's maybe something that i didn't abuse as much in smash 4 is that like because dk's aerials and back airs uh, like back air is so safe and even safer in this game i actually don't feel the need to just spam grab when when my opponent is at really high percent and i can actually just do a mix of like spamming attacks, like tomahawks, uh, like different, like uh, a bunch of different attacking options, dash attack. Like I feel like I feel very comfortable doing a lot of things other than grab when my opponent is at is at high percent, and I feel like because of that, it gives me the grab a lot more often, which is something interesting to think about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the fact that you don't rely on the grab actually helps you helps you get the grab when you do need it because the. The other the opponent's not expecting it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah and that's... I think yeah, I think that's. Uh, I've also when I've been playing, I've played some games where I literally tell myself I'm not allowed to cargo down through off stage. <laughs> I've I've actively said I'm not allowed to do it this game. I'm gonna find a different way to kill my opponent every time. <laughs> I feel that man. I know Daigo once famously said that he tried to win every game a different way so that he'd never have to to rely on any one tool or be known for one gimmick or trick. Right. Can you, uh, for our viewers that are not uh, aware of Street Fighter lore, can you explain who Daigo is? For, yeah, Daigo is for... arguably the best fighting game player of all time, Street Fighter legend. Um, you know, and, and those principles cross over to Smash as well, you know. Right. Uh, but I want to talk about techniques. Like, this last week has been really huge in terms of uh, techniques in, in Smash Bros., um, you know, namely being my Smash Corners attack canceling, and AV. I actually think we should put the attack canceling video in the show notes and in the description of our YouTube video, because I'll say it here. I think D one, D one put it succinctly when he said, "Like, just watch this video and learn. This is important." <laughs> and I agree <laughs> yeah. with this synopsis. Um, basically, there's a new technique called attack canceling, which allows for um, it just it just opens up new movement possibilities. I'll just put it broadly, and it's a very weird technique in terms of its implementation. You kind of have a very specific control scheme. Control scheme. Uh, it, it it's just kind of different than anything that we've had before in terms of input in the Smash franchise. So it's kind of one of those things that's gotten my mind rolling about this whole idea of the comfort zone. Like, look, here we have this technique that for sure is going to be important to the metagame. I mean, if you really want to become good, there's not, there's no use not, uh, you know, learning this technique. I'll put it that way. It's that important. I'll, I'll equate it to, like, perfect pivoting or something like that in Smash 4. It's important. Um, so when something like this c comes to pass, and, you, you know, you're given this, this 
challenge from the gods. Like, hey, you know, do you want to learn this technique? Okay, here you go. And basically there's this, you know, multiple hour, uh, you know, floor that you have to pass before you can even begin to start implementing this technique in like a somewhat realistic tournament tournament way. And let's say this, this video comes out, right? And then the next day you have a tournament, right? And you're tempted to use this technique in tournaments, but you haven't practiced it enough. So should you try to go for it in tournament or should you not even try to go for it at all? It kind of puts you in this weird situation where you have to suddenly weigh short-term gains for potential long-term rewards, right? Like, um, <laughs> and, and I like to think of this kind of stuff as an investment. Like right now, the way I'm looking at it is when new techniques come out and, uh, you know, important meta defining things come to come to the limelight. My personal philosophy, and I'm curious to get your take on this, too, is I'm going to go full bore into this. You know, if I if I if I mess this up in tournament, if I lose some friendlies for practicing this or going for going for, um, you know, the attack cancel back air, the dash attack cancel. Um, so be it. But in six months from now, I want to be able to do it perfectly without fail. hundred percent of the time in every situation, you know, how are you approaching the, you know, those kind of things? Just like investing, like you, like you said, so good investors buy when the market's low. Great investors sell when the market's high and buy when the market's low. <laughs> so just like that, I will be doing it every time in friendlies and I will be practicing like practicing this, this technique in friendlies every single time. But until I know that I have it down and, and like until I know that it won't hurt my play in tournament to go for it, I won't. Because tournament play, it is high pressure. Uh, but it's like contrived high pressure. You can create that situation with money matches or by simply just caring about your friendlies more. Uh, you, you, I, I be, and because it's such a low percentage of the games that you play, you're, you're like sometimes you can go into a tournament and only play four games. Because it's such a low percentage, I don't find it, I don't find it uh, useful to to like use it in tournament until I have it completely down. And then when I do. And when and like I but I will take my friendlies really seriously in terms of learning it and implementing it. And then when I do get it down, that's when I transition it over. Does this give me like am I am I losing out? Like am I not uh, implementing these techniques as fast? That's a really interesting question. Yeah, but I feel like there is this balance of the fact that I don't necessarily need to give up like short term short term gains. Uh, just. Uh, just to get to get long term gain that that is not that is not necessarily like seriously improved by only a few games in tournament. See, I disagree with you. I, I I think that you can you can create suspense or you can create stakes in friendlies, in money matches, stuff like that. But I think that there's nothing like tournament. You know, when you're when you have you know. Uh, social status on the line when you have people cheering for you, watching you, uh, when this contributes to your ratings, you know, like I'll, I'll equate it to this, like like let's say ledge trumping. That's that's a tech that's really important in Smash Four and Ultimate, more so in Smash Four. But the the instant ledge trump is a pretty hard technique to input. Basically, for those who don't know, it's when you're on stage and you instantly snap to the ledge from stage. If you mess up the technique, you know you can SD with some characters or, you know, you can at least give up stage control and put yourself in a really bad position underneath the stage, you know, at the very least, you know, for me, there was a huge mental barrier in actually doing this in tournament because you mess it up. That could be a stock and one stock in a tournament set could be the difference. And I don't know, man, I, I, I totally agree that like as you learn new techniques and new characters, you should put yourself in st stressful situations. Uh, but I, I, I don't think... I, I think it's inevitable that... I mean, your point was that you don't need to give up short-term success in, uh, in pursuit of a, a long-term benefit. And I disagree with you. I, I think that you're still going to have to go for it in tournament at some point for the first time. That's still going to be hard. Right. 
that much is fair i think that there is a point where you where yeah you have to go for it you have to pull the trigger and if you're not used to pulling the trigger in in that setting i agree that's not you're you're never going to do it so there is there is a sense of i mean there is there's a sense of the fact that like let's just say i'm i'm like up 10 and then i'm up like two stocks in a tournament set i'll, I'll probably start going for it then uh like there there's like there's actually moments where where like the risk reward would make complete sense for me i i would like make that ad adaptation immediately and say hey this would be a really good time with something on the line with the reputation on the line to go for it uh i i think that well well i i think i appreciate that you disagree with me because i think we both bring different viewpoints to this i don't necessarily think either of us is right or maybe, or or, or maybe, maybe you do, but I, I actually appreciate your your perspective on this. Uh, but I will say that there's the whole story about having this like a lot of like a notoriety or ego or just or the ranking on the line. I think is very like uh, is very movie esque or <laughs> very very like fantasy esque in terms of in terms of the 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 concept of of this grand. <laughs> of this of, of this like in tournament vibe where like you you lose so much if you uh if you um uh, i mean it's like where, where you like have to implement these these things in in game or 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 you never do it at all i actually i think there is a more nuanced answer where you can slowly like bring it in in your in your friendlies and then you and then once you're really comfortable with it you can you, you will you will start going forward in tournament. It's like when you said that, it makes me think of like a like an anime or a, or a TV show where like the the winner like the, the the protagonist has like never practiced this like really insane technique, and then like in, in like the crush time he he like he or she like nails it. <laughs> that's 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 what you're you're making. It's you know, like it's like it's like Goku's first Kamehameha wave. Or uh, dude, it's like it's like uh, the Jedi's in Star Wars, where they have like that little practice droid that shoots lasers on them when their eyes are closed. Right. Like, imagine like your whole life you're blocking these little like practice lasers. The first time somebody shoots a gun at you, I think I think it changes. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. Uh, there is a huge difference between in in like in like in practice and and in tournament, which is why I think that there is. There is like this beautiful nuanced answer in between both of the viewpoints. Okay, sure thing. I mean, I don't know. I, uh, fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, but I, I've I've kind of seen a lot of people really resistant to the change. Um, you know, and and I'll, I'm I'm specifically referencing attack canceling again. Watch the video in the show notes uh, that explains explains it. It's important. I'm just saying. I'm um, after this episode, of course. Uh, but. Uh, I I've talked to people. I've I've seen people on Twitter and and in different group chats. I'm in Discord servers talking about you know I don't really think that I'm gonna spend time learning this technique. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of I'm fine as is whatever. Um, you know I don't really think that the benefits worth the investment, uh, time investment. And the thing is is like I empathize that with that to a degree. Like when I was a kid, Av. Uh, <laughs> I hated change. Um, when when winter would start and I have to start wearing pants instead of shorts, I would cry my eyes out. <laughs> and then yeah. when spring came around, I had to start wearing shorts instead of pants. Same thing. It was an, another waterfall of tears. And my mm -hmm. parents would laugh about it every year, like clockwork. They just knew. Then once the season changed, they knew they knew to anticipate my sorrow. Um, and so look, I'm not. I'm not saying that I'm not afraid of change either. I get it. But when it comes to, you know, if you're listening to this podcast, you're probably kind of diehard into Smash, which means you're going to put a lot more time into it in the future. So like three, four hours of investment and some minor speed bumps, um, you know, within the first couple of weeks of implementation to unlock a whole bunch of new movement possibilities and, and uh, you know potential for your character for as long as you play the game forever. I think that's worth it, and I think that people. I, this is my call out to you guys, saying, "Look, test yourself, fight through the change." I mean, you owe it to yourself. Yeah, 
I mean, I agree to to uh, obviously I agree to to the point of testing yourself and uh, and improving for the long term goals. I think one huge barrier to entry is the control scheme changing. I am blessed with the fact that I use the exact same control scheme as you need for attack canceling, and I use that beforehand. <laughs> So I think that because of that, this was a no-brainer for me. Like, because I use the exact control scheme that is required for attack canceling, I basically said, okay, I need to learn this because it would be silly if I, if I just didn't use something that was now available to me. I, I do wanted to say that yeah. exact thing is tilt stick and putting jump on one of your triggers, right? Right, yes. Yeah. And and the, and the reason I use that is because in Smash 4, I used uh, tilt stick for perfect pivot down tilts and perfect pivot up tilts with DK. And in uh, and, and, and L jump would be used to, I would use uh, L jump for ding dong. Oh, okay. So, yeah. So, so now that I, so basically I'm just using the same setup that I had before, which is pretty cool. Although I do think that it's a huge barrier to entry for some people who, don't feel like they would they they would uh get that lot they don't see the long-term benefit in like like massively like changing the way that they play and i i i like like you said i i do empathize with that because there, there was one point where i tried to learn beto and it was wild like i yeah I but beto like, was something completely it, else that was that yeah. was that was yeah. crazy yeah, for for what for for people who, for the uninitiated, Beto was this wild control scheme in that you would use on pro controllers, uh, in Smash Four, which basically you could do it with access. GameCube too. Yeah, you could, but it was extremely difficult. Uh, that was only. Yeah, it, it was because of the lack of uh, four triggers. Uh, you, you need four triggers to do it easily instead of three. Also, the, with the way that with with the way that Smash Four handled the trigger the trigger presses, it was uh, the pro controllers had a slight advantage there. Um, but yes, you could. You're, you're absolutely right. You could do it with GameCube, although it although it wasn't as easy. Uh, and, and and the thing is, it just basically required you completely changing the way that you play the game. In yeah. And in return, you got like really cool movement, and you basically got to like perfect pivot all over the stage and attack and do all these things out of perfect pivot as if you were like wave dashing in in melee. Although definitely not as <laughs> definitely definitely not as as uh, as useful as useful as that. So like I understand that it is it is kind of ridiculous to completely change the way that you play. Although I I, I think for something as useful as this, like it, it's it's kind of a no brainer for me. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's fair. That's fair. I, I still think that no matter how difficult it is, you should you should go for it. And look, I don't want to be yeah. hypocritical because there are plenty of things in life that I don't know about you, but that like I know would be a long-term benefit, <laughs> but the short-term pain that it would cause me deters me. Like, I mean, look, I don't look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. If I wanted to, I could. But, you know... It's hard to have the, the the sort of discipline to go to the gym and to eat like perfect a perfect diet. You know what I mean? So look, I'm not I'm not saying that I'm some perfect model of a of of sacrificing the short term for long term benefit. But at least in Smash, man, I can say I'm I'm an advocate for it. <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's like I it's become it's coming close to the end of the year, and I've I have the option to throw a bunch of money into my IRA. <laughs> and I was like, I know it's going to be good for me the long term, but uh, <laughs> but I'm, but uh, I don't know why I'm, 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 I'm holding off. So I totally, I totally feel you there. Yeah, man. Um, I, I want to talk about, you know, some people, I think, are in a comfort zone or like they're deep into their comfort zone. They're sitting in their comfort cave on their recliner. I don't know. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> and and they don't even realize it, or at least they're like partially in denial about it, or even more dangerous, in my opinion, they're kind of content about it. Um, and for those kind of people, I think you can really tell that you're that kind of person if when a new revolutionary tech, like attack canceling comes out, if you kind of go, oh, oh man, I have to learn that, or like, oh, like, wow. I have to put this work in to do this, or I have to learn this character for this matchup. 
you know, if you kind of uh, really uh, resent those kind of happenings and those kind of findings, then you're probably who who we're addressing. Um, Amy, what do you what do you have to say to these people? I think that there. I the thing is, I see a lot of these people in in the Smash community. I've seen them in in both of the communities that have that have been a part of. And it and the thing is, is that it really just depends. It really just is really is important to know what your goals are. I mean, if you're seeing that you're plateauing, you're getting the similar like you're the same placements at tournaments. You're 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 watching people that you that you used to like be consistently kind of give you more of a challenge or improve or surpass you and you're like doing the same thing and expecting different results like it's it's pretty common to get in to get into this situation and i actually think the majority of people are here which is why i which is why i don't i don't want to talk to talk to like this group as if i'm talking to a minority i think the most 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 people are actually here and the thing is, is that like kind of taking this jump to go and learn something new or push yourself is very brave. It's something that requires sacrifice and something and sacrifice, especially emotional sacrifice in something as as possibly trivial as a video game is very difficult for some people uh it's it's not it, it it's not worth it for some people like it, it's not worth to give up the the ego boost you get from beating your friends just because you want to just because you want to learn something yeah that's it's kind like, of a good you, point like like the whole yeah. like pushing back against a video game i mean this is a video game yeah. obviously like we see it as more than that we see it as a competitive experience we see right. it as like a platform for self-growth uh but <laughs> it's a game <laughs> Yeah, you know, and you don't want to you don't want to bash your head against a game that you could easily otherwise have fun with. Yeah, it's so strange, right? It's like it's we how much we value it is basically how how much we value uh being being a competitive player. And and the thing is like at some point I totally understand it's just not worth it's just not worth completely changing how you play when you're when you're when you're doing fine or you're meeting your own expectations. Um, however, there there is a point where you get where where you kind of just stagnate, and if you are playing competitively, you you ask yourself, why am I doing the same? Why am I why why am I performing similarly, or why am I not able to do different things or play different characters? And that's when you want to start looking to see like how do we get out of this comfort zone how do we like what are the techniques we can use to to break this and this isn't necessarily sma- confined to the realm of smash all of these things are you know, all of these comfort zones and all of these uh all these habits and rituals that we that we succumb to are are existent in our daily lives so all of this advice is is like kind of cross it's it's basically uh cross like metagame cross like IRL <laughs> like applicable because because you can because all of the things that you do to get rid of your habits in smash you can do to get rid of your habits in real life. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's fair. I mean, do you think that the people that uh are likely to kind of rest with the laurels and and are uh, averse to change out of smash are also the same in smash so do you think it crosses over pretty one to one uh, i don't want to make value judgments about people outside of smash <laughs> <And then you laughs> quit, quit. i hey, do smash. i'm looking at I you mean, I... wi-fi king k rule all right <laughs> but, uh, but i but i i actually have seen that uh i do see that wait did you it, just it, say it, i don't want to make value judgments but yes <laughs> is that what I just yeah, heard? Well, I, I I said I don't want to make like I I said I have observed it, but I don't want to make a generalized statement that says it's true for everyone. <laughs> that's that's but, weak, bro. Get off the fence. I mean, if I'm on the if if I want to get off the fence, I'll get off on the side saying that if you're if you're constantly like breaking your comfort zones, like IRL, you're gonna be a lot better at breaking your comfort zones in the game. Huh. Yeah. So I, I, I will. If you're gonna ask me to get off the fence, I will jump in the, on that side. 
Uh, and and thing is, I, I will I, I will confidently jump on that side because uh, because that that's just that's something that because as I've I've grown as like as some as through my career or at, at the gym or in in like learning other other games. I have constantly thought about this, and I've and I've basically implemented this framework of how of how to break out of comfort zones and how to make and and how to how to make myself uncomfortable, and it crosses over so easily for me at this point that it's like it's very it's very straightforward, which is why I think that if people if if people practice this in other in other things, I feel like it would be more intuitive to implement in Smash. Okay, well, walk us through your framework. Like, what do you do to how do you think of this? How do you get out of your ruts? Right. I mean, there's there's a there's a few different techniques you can do it. I mean, I was explaining one of them is like the limiting your options. Like if you're used to getting if you're used to getting kills or or performing well with one specific option, like I said, the cargo down throw or ding dong in Smash 4, play games without it. Remove that remove that from your from your toolkit. Limiting so, your toolkit leaves you access to things that you didn't necessarily see before. So you and the misses, right? You know, things are getting stale in the in the, in the wedding chamber. <laughs> so you say, okay, no more missionary. Yeah, yeah. If I that that would be an apt <laughs> analogy. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's I. That's like. Is exactly- that why I saw you hanging out with Mrs. Donaldson last night? Oh my god. <laughs> Dude, don't you can't expose me like this, dude. <laughs> <laughs> and as a matter of fact, Mr. Donaldson was looking pretty friendly with your missus, so okay. <laughs> yeah, I I think that I, I agree. Like it there's there's like so You agree many, with Mrs. Donaldson? No, I agree <laughs> with your with your the point of your thought experiment here. <laughs> Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, so, so, I, so uh, yeah, <laughs> I, wait, I had a point. <laughs> what was my point? Your only well, point is that if you change some, if, well, at least I'm going to interpret it in the most generous way possible, <laughs> and, <laughs> and say that uh, if you is that changing things outside of Smash is, and basically saying like, okay, I'm going to do different things at work. I'm going to take on different tasks, or I'm going to try a different program or a different workout at the gym. Or I'm going to like try different things when I play my other competitive games. Will make it easier to, or like yeah, we're just trying different things in in like in the bedroom. <laughs> like it's like it's 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 strange to think about, but the more that you stagnate and the more inertia that you accumulate in general, I feel like the the more likely you are to not push yourself in in Smash. Yeah, hey, I'm down for that. I'm down for that. So yeah, I mean, New Year's is right around the corner. If you're listening to this, maybe you already are listening to this in 2019. And if you are, I hope everything's all right. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I do, I do want to advocate for hey, let's be more adventurous in 2019. You know, let's let we had a new Smash game. You know, let's let's act like it. Let's learn the new techniques. Let's go full bore. Let's let's let, let let's invite change into our lives. Let's really roll with it now before our habits become too sh- shaped and glued, and before you know your wife you know isn't as uh, <laughs> desirable as she once was. You know what I mean? <laughs> let's get that, let's get ahead of it. Right. Uh, I mean, like, what what are the ways that you kind of break out of your uh, your ruts or your comfort zones? Oh, you're asking me? Yeah, that that is one. Yeah, you know, I, I I'm and perhaps there's a better way around this, but I'm a very uh, by force kind of a guy. Um, so let's say in Smash, uh, when it comes to like I said, I've been playing Inkling. That's my kind of the main I'm trying to pursue. Um, so I've just been forcing myself to play Inkling. I mean, as dumb as that sounds, um, even on matchups where I feel more comfortable with Cloud, even in tournament, I'm saying, you know what? No, ride or die Inkling. We're going to commit to this change. We're going to see how it goes. We're going to learn some stuff from it. And, you know, that might not work for some people. Um, you know, because some people might be a little bit less stubborn than I. Uh, when it comes to committing to whatever change you want to make. 
Um, but what I do is I really try to shape my attitude um, and and form my attitude around the idea of getting out of these comfort zones. And, and in practice, what I mean by that is like, for instance, when I play against when I play friendlies against other people, I do all of the stuff that I want to learn. I spam in friendlies. I, I use friendlies as sort of a um, a mobile laboratory where like it, I use it like a training mode without my opponent knowing. You know, even if I lose the friendly, that's okay if I landed a certain combo I've been trying to experiment with or I successfully implemented a new technique that I've been trying to learn. That's kind of what I focus on. And and um, I really try to uh, practice the change as opposed to thinking about it or um, anything else. I, I want to challenge you here a little. Okay. Uh, I want to. I want to. I want to say: Is there a moral obligation that you have to play as if you were playing in tournament against against someone? Because because the thing is, when you play friendlies, it's, it's a it's a two way handshake. You're you're helping them, and they're helping you. Do you do you have some like? ethical obligation to at some point like you can't practice it but do, are, are you going to at some point play the way that you do in tournament to, to help them out uh do i have a moral obligation no i don't i don't i don't think it's a i mean i'm look man my mario is beating up your bowser i mean at a certain point like i i don't think that morality is so black and white um i i, I think that if somebody expresses to me you know hey peon we come over to my house i want to get some really serious practice tournament conditions i really want to test myself and i say sure thing i go i show up and i'm I'm goofing around yeah that's kind of messed up but if it's just you know if we're if there's no sort of agreement or if that my opponent doesn't express to me that they want something specific out of this just no i'm just gonna do what i what's best for me Uh, that's fair if somebody yeah somebody says yo let's play a real set i'll say sure and i and i'll take that more seriously but beyond that, no, I don't think there's any more obligation. Do you? Um, not not necessarily. I think I have a similar view to 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 you. Although I one thing that I will do in friendlies is that I I, I will spend about like kind of the first half of a friendly session practicing all of the new things, and then I'll spend the second half playing as if I did in tournament. And I and I I I don't know why I split it up like that, but I feel like it's a lot easier to to autopilot at the end of a friendly session than it is at the than than it than it than it is the beginning. Well, that makes sense. Like you're like yeah. play a sport where the first part of the practice is do drills. The second half you'll like scrimmage or whatever. You know, you'll you'll try to implement whatever you learned. Right, right, exactly. And and the thing is uh one thing that I that I will do uh to to change things up is I will play as many different people as humanly possible. The most important thing about friendlies, in my opinion, is finding as many different people to play against. Because different people punish different parts of your gameplay. And the thing is, the more the more resistances that you can build by playing, like think of every like think of every different player that you play against as like a as as a certain type, <laughs> as a or as a, or a certain type of enemy. And the more that you fight that enemy, the more resistance you gain to that type of enemy. So the more the diff, the, the more uh, versus the more uh, diverse your group of uh, of training partners, the more the more situations that you're going to be prepared for. So getting out of your comfort zone in term in in this realm is not only practicing things to implement them like so just just ba- like basic tech or stuff like yeah stuff that you want to like technically implement but also like playing against different people and i really emphasize i really emphasize that because half of the game is is this like mental this this mental chess game where you're you're not sure what your opponent's going to do and you have to predict what your opponent's going to do and your prediction is a uh, is basically created and and is be- is created by your predisp- predispositions about what you think your opponent is, and if you think your opponent is a certain type of player and you're comfortable with playing against that kind of player, you're going to be comfortable and you're going to uh, 
you're going to be really likely to take the W in that situation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for instance, even when I went to my first major, I played against a really kind of projectile-based Link. And then right after that, I played a uh, vegan. <laughs> Are you kidding? Am I kidding? <laughs> like, how did you know he was vegan? <laughs> what did that inform you about his Smash play stuff? So I think now is a good time to move on to our questions. <laughs> Uh, we got a lot of questions from our Discord this week. Um, and yeah, I want to remind you guys, now that I brought it up, join our Discord. There'll be a link down in the show notes below and on YouTube. And hey, come join. We have a really uh, growing community, really friendly people. Everybody in there is on the grind. Everybody's getting better every single day. You know, AV and I will hop into voice chat with you. We'll talk to you. We'll type with you. Um, we'll play friendlies with you. You know, we, we do that pretty, pretty often with our community. If you want to show up, say, hey. You know, this AV, this PN guy, you know, <laughs> these guys probably suck. Let me give them the hands. By all means, come play us. We'd, lo- we'd, love, to, we'd love to play you. Um, but some questions from our Discord this week. I'm going to start it off by reading one to AV. Are you, are you down with that? Yeah, let's go for it. Okay, so Treeling asks, what do you think about the fact that shield dropping is out of the game? Seems like jumping off platforms is the only real option. Also, thoughts on Dr. Mario? Um, I didn't know that shield dropping was out of the game, so that's that's actually news to me. Um, so I, I think you can still I mean you can just let go of shield and drop and drop and drop through platforms normally. Uh I think I I, I think the you don't nec- you don't necessarily need to uh to jump off of them. Uh, I think something that I see pretty commonly is uh people will uh press down through a platform and then just do an attack through it just to cover the landing uh, yeah but shield dropping was great because it, it bypassed the shield drop animation you could just right but did, did you shield drop in smash 4 yes okay yes right. it, um but I, I i'm upset that it's that's out of the game tree link to be honest um i think that it was a perfectly good mechanic it's been in every iteration of smash up until this point why take it out i have no idea I don't really think it serves any purpose. So I'm pretty bummed that it's out of the game, I'll be honest. It's a minor gripe, but I wish it was there. Um, yeah, and it does limit your op- your options on a platform. I agree. It takes one away. That's dumb. Uh, Dr. Mario, he seems pretty good and also pretty unexplored. I know Zenyu was saying, Zenyu the Mario player from SoCal was saying that he doesn't really see the hubbub about Mario, or Dr. Mario rather. He doesn't see the potential. Whereas I've seen, you know, heard a lot of other people say, yo, you know, this character actually has a lot. He has a lot off of grab. Um, so my current thoughts, Treeling, is that Dr. Mario is good and unexplored, which is scary I, to me. Yeah, I mean, I feel like Dr. Mario's combo game feels better than Mario's. I don't know. It's really weird. <laughs> like, I, I like, I actually vastly prefer playing Dr. Mario to Mario. Which is very, which is very strange. I, I think you mentioned it like in one of the previous episodes, and then that made me think like, okay, why don't why don't I go and play this character? And I actually really like him. Cool. Uh, I'll read the next one too. Kuda asks, um, how do you suggest to take on a character that goes against your ultimate playstyle? Um, so, I think they're talking about like picking up a character. Not not fighting against a character, so mm-hmm. like a Rob main would pick up either Fox or a Wolf or a Sorty. Uh, they write um, thoughts. Uh, I think that learning a new character is learning an archetype. There's very like uh, there's there's characters that have their own archetype, like you were talking about. I mean, Inkling kind of has their own archetype. But I actually think that Inkling does fall in a in in a certain bucket of of characters. But there there are some really really unique characters that are not that are that are not like any other else. But like if you, in my opinion, there's there's just groups of characters that you need to learn. If you play, in my opinion, if you play one sword character, other sword characters become more familiar to you. So taking on a new type of character is not only learning one character but you should view it as learning a group of characters there's and okay like if 
if you look at win conditions, do you have your win condition off of grab? Do you have your win condition off of like a weak attack into strong attack confirm? Is your win condition based off of specials? So start grouping characters together and on and look at all of their options. And the thing is, once you have picked up one character, look at how those aspects transfer over into your other characters. And that that's what I would that's what I would say. I mean, obviously picking up a completely different like paradigm of of of, of characters is, is difficult, but you but look for similarities is what I would say. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a that's a good answer. I'm into it. I have anything else to add. All right, cool. Uh, so Nintendo gamer Chris asks, "Is there a character in Smash that got you curious about another gamer series that you ultimately enjoyed a lot?" For me, that's Roy. Yeah, so, that's a great yeah. question. Um, I definitely would say that Fire Emblem, uh, the Fire Emblem representatives, got me into Fire Emblem. Too. Uh, so for me, um, I, I can't really say it was one representative in particular, but you know, the combination of Roy, Marth, Robin, Ike, all those guys, uh, you know, maybe say, look, I got to play some Fire Emblem game. So I played Fire Emblem Awakening for the DS or 3DS. I liked it. It was fun. Um, but other than that, I can't think of a character that explicitly made me go, yo, this character is dope. I got to see what their games are about. Did you have that experience, A.B.? I mean, I played mostly DK and Cloud. I mean, actually, after I played Cloud, I think I, I felt like it was obligatory to go play Final Fantasy VII. So uh, so I did play a bit of Final Fantasy VII. Uh, although, like, because I played mostly DK, I think at one point when I came over to your to, to your place, you were like, okay, we're playing Donkey Kong Country <laughs> like, right now. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, I made you do it. Yeah, you made me do it, and I was pretty good at it. I, I was, I wasn't, I was, I was not bad at, at, Don, at Donkey Kong Country. So I, I might actually go and 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 play through some more of the Donkey Kong games. Oh, please do for me. Uh, I will say this though, Nintendo gamer Chris, that uh, I did end up playing Bayonetta one because I got it for free with a uh, Games for Gold on Xbox. Came came with my uh, online subscription. And so I, I checked it out. I was like, you know what? Bayo's in Smash. I don't really know anything about her games. Let me give it a look. And honestly, after playing Bayonetta 1, I I had such a greater appreciation for Bayonetta as a character. Because Bayonetta, that game is wild. It is so crazy and so over the top. And Bayonetta is such a badass in that game. And she's so funny and cool. That even though Bayonetta was the most annoying character to fight against in Smash Four, I I had to admit that I was a little bit more, a little bit a little bit more tolerant of her after I played her own game. Um, but Xander asks, with Zero currently struggling to find a main and new rising talent out there, who do you think is currently the strongest player in Ultimate, and which player are you most interested in following? Uh, I think is I, I want to give it, I'll give a boring answer because it's what I truly believe in that I have no idea who is the current strongest player in Ultimate. Because all right, I'll answer this. Tweak. There's been <laughs> Tweak. You think, you think Tweak, Tweak's, Tweak's my pick? I mean, Tweak did win the Sky Invitational, okay. um, which is you know that and uh, Don't Park on the Grass were the only two like major events. Um, you know, one was an Invitational, but just watching Tweak play. This guy seems nuts, and not only is he nuts, he plays multiple characters. You know, he's really good. I've seen his Cloud play. I've seen his uh, Crom play. I've seen his Donkey Kong play, and it just seems like he has such a great grasp of the mechanics so far. And he just has had some dominating performances already uh, in brackets. Um, and I gotta say, Tweak is gonna be a problem. He's my pick right now to be number one in the first PGR. So, whereas I don't have a specific pick, I will say that the player that I'm most interested in following is Konga. I think Konga has been doing some really cool things with DK, and I'll likely be looking out for uh, for any cool things that that he's up to. Uh, so, moving on to the next question, we have uh, Ultimut, who says, "Which character, new or old, 
do you think has the greatest upward mobility in the meta once people start figuring out how to optimize them? That's a really interesting question. What do you think? Yeah, I love that question. I love that question. So for me, a couple options jump out. One of them being Inkling, and perhaps that's showing some personal bias. I'm playing Inkling, and I so I kind of understand the potential of the character because I've played, played Inkling so much. So Inkling um, has some stuff that really makes her skill ceiling super high. Her combo game is extremely flowcharty, but there's a lot of guaranteed combos at specific percents versus specific characters, which once optimized, we'll see... You know, you'll see crazy consistent damage output from Inkling. You already kind of do, but it's only going to get more and more ridiculous. Plus, Booyah, the up throw up air, a true combo with Booyah, is an extremely precise input. I mean, I'm talking a couple frames uh, precision. Um, it, you know, it, it's like the least true true combo I've ever seen in a Smash game. Uh, it's ridiculously hard to input um, consistently against certain characters. Um, mm-hmm. So once inkling mains get that every time and every time you're within the window you get grabbed to death that's going to be crazy on a character that really doesn't need that to be good um and i'll say ken and ryu of course but ken seems to have some crazy ridiculous combos like the up air and assure you and um just really technical uh high difficulty high reward combos that in like six, seven months, I don't want to fight a Ken player. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of, that was my natural response was the Street Fighter characters. Um, I will say that here's a few of the characters that I'd be looking for in terms of, in terms of radical upward mobility. I would say one of them is Captain Falcon. I think... Captain Falcon has a lot of interesting kill setups now, uh, and with and I don't think any fast character uh, with strong moves can be bad. <laughs> I think that there's a lot to be explored with him. I think you never Snake... seen Little Mac. Moving on, <laughs> <laughs> I, I I think uh, I think Snake, I think Snake is 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 another character. There's there's a lot of. Uh, there, there, there's a lot of opinions about whether Snake is good or not. I, I think Snake is is a very good character that is is currently underexplored because people because people just haven't haven't figured out the haven't re reabsorbed the archetype from Brawl. I think I think Snake's gonna get a lot of uh is gonna start to get a lot of traction later down in the game, and then. And then the last, I think I'm gonna give two more: Greninja and Sonic. Those are so those are gonna be my four: huh. Captain Falcon, Snake, Greninja, and Sonic. Uh, I think those are. I think Snake has received some play, but we haven't seen too much play from the other three. But I think the other three are going to be very good. Okay, and then uh, someone from our Discord asks, "Av, what are you wearing right now?" Uh, I am wearing nothing. <laughs> I, I, I am I'm wearing. Uh, what if I was just wearing like s- snakes leopard print suit? Like, what what would you? That would be crazy. Would, only because I also am wearing snakes leopard skin suit. <laughs> uh, no, but someone actually asks, what is the best slash most optimal way to learn a new character? So I feel like we have touched on this earlier in, in term in terms of learning how to learn and in improving and improving your technical ability, but I don't think we've spe- uh, we've uh, specifically talked about learning characters, or we, we might have, but I think in general, uh, just understanding frame data, understanding good options. So the first thing you look at is the neutral game. Uh, what are your options in neutral? Uh, if you're, if if let's just say you're cloud, what are your options that you can spam pretty safely? Like you're gonna spam your back air and your forward airs. So those are gonna be your neutral options. So then you have your options that you're gonna use in neutral, and then you look at your punish game. Like what once you hit something in neutral, and once you get your punish disadvantage, 
or a position where you can use another move. Like, what move are you going to use? So there's this like beautiful flowchart that you can follow in terms of getting used to a character's movement, understanding what options are usable where, and and just following that that chart. I think if you look at Zero's recent video on learning neutral and ultimate, I think that you'll find a lot of useful information there. Yeah, I, I think that's I think that's more complicated than I would put it. I, I, if if I were to tell you this, I would say uh, learn how to start your combos. Learn how to learn which moves of yours are good kill moves, and learn how to recover. Beyond that, uh, check out your character's Discord. Let's say you want to pick up Mewtwo, join the Mewtwo Discord. They there. I mean, I've never been to the Mewtwo Discord, but I'm I'm just gonna go on a limb and say they will have a million pieces of information for you to read for every single situation, for every little thing. There's gonna be an entire community of people there that will tell you. Hey, uh, you know, this matchup's like this. Why do you guys do this? Well, what are your favorite stages? Whatever. There'll be a bunch of experts there that you can consult for free. That's what I would do. Um, I joined the Inkling Discord, uh, Inkopolis, it's called, and uh, it, they've been a godsend to me. Uh, so, yeah, that's what I would recommend, um, AV. But that does bring us uh, to today's conclusion. Uh, thank you guys so much for joining us. Uh, AV, where can people find you? People can find me at A. Vaidinato, which is my uh, long Indian last name. <laughs> and uh, where can people find you? So here's the thing. You can find me at peon underscore GCE. That's Golf Charlie Echo for all you Protestants. And you can find the show at Beyond Metagame. That's right. At Beyond Metagame. Because Twitter did not leave any room for the the. Uh, but with that. I bring us to the conclusion of our show. Guys, thank you so much for listening. Make sure to check in next week. It'll be 2019. So, hey, enjoy your New Year's. You know, drink a little bit or a lot of bit. Either way, be safe about it. And we'll see you next week. Goodbye.